Good morning, everybody. 
Welcome to Allen Avenue Unitarian Universalist Church um, for our in-person and online worship. Uh, whether today is your first time here or you've been coming for years, we are so glad to have you with us. My name is Troy Moon, my pronouns are he, his, and I'm a member of the Board of Trustees. We are a growing community that transforms lives through the power of love. Our mission calls for us to celebrate diversity, encourage spiritual growth, and promote social responsibility while we work, travel with care uh, on this earth. Uh, we, are also, um, we are also to those at home who are joining us on Zoom. If you're attending for the first time, please go to our website and fill out the welcome card so we can get to know you better. Um, for announcement, um, in your order of service, there's a green paper. It's about our exciting ATU2 Holiday Artisans Market. So um, please uh, visit uh, Terry Grover after the service. Um, she, she has a big chart with the opportunity to sign up to help. It's a big event and it's important for our fundraising this year. So uh, hopefully um, you can maybe donate something or a volunteer to participate and certainly come and support the affair. Um, and if you're in the sanctuary this morning, we invite you to take this opportunity to silence your cell phone so you can be fully present. And we're so glad you've joined us. After the service, please join us for coffee and conversation in the sanctuary. And this morning, we have a special guest um, minister, uh, Reverend John B. Newhall. Uh, John is a trustee and vice moderator of the UUA board. Um, Reverend Newhall is a graduate student at uh, the BU School of Theology and is a lifelong UU. Uh, John uh, studied, studies religion and American history with a special focus on colonial history and lives in Salem, Mass. So welcome, Reverend Newhall. And now let us center our hearts and minds with the ringing of the bell. Come into this house of peace. Come into this house of love. Come into this community of embrace. Come, let us be together. Would you all please rise in body or in spirit as we join together in singing Gather the Spirit, number 347 in the Gray Hymnal.
now be the lighting of our chalice as we welcome ourselves into community, into this space both virtually and in person. Now we're going to have our time for all ages. I'd like to invite up any children, children at heart, that would like to come forward um, as we enter into a time of wondering. Some great costumes here. <laughs> so in the spirit of a time for all ages, I, hi I highly encourage participation from all of you. Wondering is a really important aspect of being Unitarian Universalist and being human. And so in the spirit of that, there's a new addition up here for this week. And it's this box here. It's called the Wonder Box. There's something inside. Does anyone have any ideas what it might be? Anybody? Yeah. A card? It's a good guess, a good guess. Usually the first guess is pizza. <laughs> it's a little small for a nice sized pizza, but how, do we have any other guesses? A tiny dinosaur. A tiny dinosaur. Ooh, that's a new one. I like that one. A mouse. A mouse. How about? Diamonds. 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 Do any of you have any guesses? What might be in there? I don't know. Like a, a little plastic bug or a stone? Well, who want, does someone want to come and open it up for me? Yeah? Can you pull out whatever's in there. And just set it right here. Yeah. It's, look at that. What, do you know what this is? It's a chalice. Oh, you got it on the first go. I'm impressed. <laughs> I'm impressed. Oh. Yeah, the chalice is, as we can see from having multiple around the room, um, the chal it's the symbol of Unitarian Universalism. But more than that, it's the symbol of our covenant to each other and our community as we gather. It's often said that it represents the light of reason, the warmth of hope, and the fire of commitment. But it also is the encapsulation. It's almost like it bookends our community experience together. We often light it when we become into community and we blow it out or extinguish it when we leave. So I just invite you to continue thinking about what the chalice means to you. If you light one at home, if you light one whenever you're here, when you go to your classrooms, and to think about how that represents your time with each other. I invite you to go off to your classrooms. In a moment. <laughs> In a few moments, some of us <laughs> will leave the sanctuary to enjoy religious education programming. But first, I invite our lamplighter to join me in the pulpit. Ethan?
A lamp lighter is entrusted to transfer the light of the sanctuary chalice to the lamp and then go forth to Ari spaces where they will light the chalices from there. I invite those going to RE to follow the lamplighter as we carry the flame, expanding our sacred space. We will sing Carry the Flame next week when we have the music. <laughs> if you remember Go Now in Peace, we will sing that one today instead. of life and love, unknowable mystery we are endlessly searching for. Help us see the mosaic of community we've constructed. As we uplift our individuality, let us remember that we are all one, a group of multiplicities bonded by our faith in one another. We have chosen to gather here in a community of seekers because we understand that in searching together, we are strengthened. Spirit of compassion and hope, help us live more fully into each other and into community. Amen. Blessed be. We are a freely gathered, open, and welcoming faith community supported by your contributions. Each week, one third of our offering is given away to a nonprofit organization whose missions aligns with our Unitarian Universalist principles. This month's Share the Plate recipient is the main UU State Advocacy Network, also called MUSIN. Um, they are a statewide advocacy and public policy network anchored in Unitarian Universalist faith and animated by its principles. Um, you can find more information at muson.org and there's a little more information in our order of service. Donations can be made now as the basket is passed or through the donation button on our website a2u2.org or if you are a member through Breeze. If you donate through Breeze, please note if your donation is a pledge or for share the plate. 
<clears throat> you may also mail a check directly to the church. If you are visiting us for the first time this morning, please know that your presence is your gift to us. At this time, our offertory will be collected and gratefully received. Our reading this morning comes from Unitarian Universalist minister, Reverend Lisa Ward, and is entitled, A Covenant Invites Relationship. A covenant is not a definition of a relationship. It is the framework for our relating. A covenant leaves room for chance and change. It is humble toward evolution. It claims, I will abide in you in this common endeavor. Be present as best I can in our becoming. This calls for a level of trust, 
courage and sacrifice that needs to be nurtured, renewed, and affirmed on a regular basis. A creed creates a static truth, something that does not incorporate new insights and realities. A covenant is a dance of co-creation, keeping in step with one another in the flow of our lives. A creed seeks uniformity and a unison voice. A covenant seeks harmony and a shared voice. Sometimes we may arrive at unison, but it is not required. A creed gives authority to the statement. A covenant gives authority to shared intention. A creed creates an us and a them, and a covenant invites relationship. A creed is a prescription that must be relied on, and a covenant relies on the treasures of shared truth. The overall trust within this covenant is the truth, capital T, something which no one person can fully see, yet something which each and every person can come to know in glimpses, in another's story, in epiphanies. Truth is ever-changing in our seeking to understand because of our limited perspectives. We grow into a deeper sense of the meaning of all things when we take our journeys seriously, with full heart and mind. The courage within this covenant is in the acceptance and celebration of life with all its challenges, pain, ironies, and joys. And the sacrifice within this covenant is in letting go of dogma, of assumptions, of control, and giving over to a greater wisdom which comes in bits and pieces. The task of this covenant is to take responsibility for the freedom we espouse. We know that we are interconnected and that what we do creates ripples of hope or despair, of affirmation or negation. What we do with and for one another is powerful beyond our imaginings. Yeah. 
I'd like to begin the sermon this morning with a short passage from Paul of Tarsus's letter to the Assembly of Jesus Followers in Corinth. <laughs> the following biblical passage comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 9. For I handed on to you as of first importance what I, in turn, had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the assemblies of God. Starting a sermon with a passage from 1 Corinthians is a weird thing to do in a Unitarian Universalist <laughs> service, right? I mean, Paul of Tarsus is an icon of the Christian tradition and a centrally important figure to the emergence of Trinitarian Christianity, which seems fundamentally at odds with the theological descendants of Unitarian Christianity. This might even be more confusing if you knew that I am an atheist. <laughs> you, you might go so far as to uh, challenge the relevance of such a passage to the Unitarian Universalist tradition at large. And personally, I do largely reject the theology of resurrection that Paul espouses in the text, but that's inconsequential at the moment. What is important about this passage? is it stands as an entrance point into engaging the diversity of belief within the early Jesus movement. And as we move together, hopefully, we can begin to see how our non-credal and non-doctrinal religion can learn and draw upon ancient sources to understand the spiritual work we are engaging. So, will you bear with me for a moment as we engage some brief history. As we've established, I'm a big lover of history. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 through 9 is a piece of a letter that gives us a lens into the world of the early Jesus movement. Beyond its theological claims about resurrection, it's what scholars refer to as an uncontested letter, which means that practic practically all scholars agree agree that it was probably written by whoever we assume to be Paul in the 40s of the Common Era, not the 1940s. This part of the letter is commonly called an ancient creed, a pre-Pauline creed in scholarly terms, and it presents Paul's recounting of what he deems important to the early Jesus movement. There are quite a few interesting elements for example, Paul completely dismisses Jesus' entire life. <laughs> that small little detail. The important details for Paul begin after Jesus has died, or most liberally with him on the cross. The central aspect of this passage revolves around the resurrection appearances of Jesus. A New Testament scholars think about how Paul adapted this creed to fit his own purposes. The most substantial change he likely made is the addition of the ending. Quote, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. End quote. Paul inserts himself as one who witnessed the resurrected Jesus. This letter from Paul to the assembly in Corinth can be viewed as a defense of Paul's authority to proclaim the evangelion, or the gospel. Exams can be turned in after the service. <laughs> in this passage, Paul defends himself as an authoritative figure who's teaching the true message of Christianity as he sees it. Why would he need to do this 
if everyone was already on the same page. Perhaps there were multiple ways people were approaching the tradition of Jesus, even just 15 years after he died. Since Paul never knew the man Jesus, and there were others at the time who did, like Peter and James, who were also preaching, Paul needed to show where he got the nerve to teach things that were sometimes the exact opposite of the teachings of those who knew Jesus. Paul spoke specifically of Jesus after his death. The resurrected Christ figure was central. Whereas for Peter and James, the life of Jesus was not to be dismissed so easily, as one might expect from those who knew Jesus before he died. Paul emphasized the loosening of Jewish tradition and preaching the gospel to Gentiles in the community. But Peter and James were in stark disagreement, emphasizing that Jewish tradition was of central importance for all followers of Jesus. All right, let's take a moment to look briefly at another instance where this ancient multiplicity is presenting itself in Revelation, another New Testament book one is unlikely to hear from UU pulpits. <laughs> we can witness this diversity, this multiplicity of opinions, of faiths and beliefs within early Jesus communities again. Written by John of Patmos, one of the many Johns in the Bible, Revelation contains seven letters to congregations in Asia Minor. In the first letter, in a congregation, to a congregation in Ephesus, John writes on behalf of the angel of God. So these are the angel of God's words as translated by John through his really confusing dreams. <laughs> I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. I know that you cannot tolerate evil doers. You have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them to be false. So here we see John of Patmos celebrating the Ephesians with the angel of God for their rejection of what he calls false apostles. Who were these folk? During the first century there was a wide dispersion of what scholar Heidi Vent calls freelance ritual experts proclaiming the teachings of Paul and Pauline tradition that were emerging from the letter we heard at the beginning. Throughout the text of Revelation, there are many passages which seem to be directly addressing and condemning the traditions proclaimed by Paul. So here again, seeing disputes, we are seeing disputes within the early Jesus movement. Paul proclaims the relaxing of Jewish traditions amongst Gentiles, and John of Patmos, possibly following in the footsteps of James, takes the opposite point of view, reinforcing the centrality of Jewish tradition and law to salvation. Here we continue to see the perpetual multiplicities within this early Jesus movement. The diversity of belief becomes even more apparent when we look at apocryphal gospels, texts that didn't make it into the New Testament, like the Gospel of Thomas, Mary, Peter, and Judas. So you're probably sitting there like, John, 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 John. What's the point? Where are you going with this? This is a lot of Bible. Good questions and good points. My question for you is, what can our covenantal tradition take from understanding the early Jesus moves, movement as a tradition of multiplicity. That is, in recognizing the wide diversity of approaches to Jesus, what can we take as inspiration for our own tradition? Unitarian Universalists hold up our covenantal religion. We heard a little bit about that during our reading. Our tradition is not grounded in the commonality of our faith, but leaves room for diversity and multiplicity. With Buddhist you use, Christian you use, Jewish you use, atheist you use, and many others, just here, I'm sure there's a wide variety of ways people are engaging the UU tradition. When I 
entered college, I began attending the local Unitarian Universalist congregation. It was one of the first things I looked for when I got to town. The congregation had called two ministers because they were undergoing a transition from their longtime minister of 25 years. The two ministers, one was a Buddhist, the other was a Christian UU, to serve in the interim as they searched for their newly settled minister. Now, let me tell you what I was hearing from some of the congregants. I heard descriptions of the fellowship as humanist, atheist, and recovering Christian-oriented. I listened and tried to soak in all that I was hearing as I got to know the congregation. We don't talk about God, some would say. We're a fellowship, not a church. And these comments were not unfamiliar to me, and as they get expressed widely across Unitarian Universalist congregations and communities. It reminded me of the often heard refrain that if you've been to one UU congregation, you've been to one UU congregation. <laughs> so imagine the surprise when one of the interim ministers begins to preach from the New Testament, to rely on Christian theology, and to invoke God regularly. Some congregants complained, but when her tenure came to a close, the new settled minister came. This new minister, while comfortable with Christian language, was not a Christian herself. And this engagement across beliefs and faiths speaks to the multiplicity of our tradition. This in the interim minister's Christian identity moved the congregation away from staunch humanistic roots and into a space that allows for translation, engagement, and conversation, and dialogue. When she said God, congregants would hear energy or mystery or that which is greater than I amongst a variety of other interpretations. In a short span of years, the congregation moved to a broader recognition of how our spiritualities, our faith commitments can be together, interact, and encourage spiritual growth. Now, when I entered Boston University's School of Theology, I was hit by a wave of culture shock. Having spent the better part of a year studying at a Unitarian Universalist seminary in Chicago, amidst mostly fellow non-Christians, I found myself rather unprepared to engage with the reality that I was suddenly in a theological minority. Nearly every student at the School of Theology comes out of a Christian tradition. Most are intending to pursue some form of ordained ministry. I spent my first year acclimating to this new climate, and now in my third year, I'm still figuring it out. <laughs> but I've slowly begun to better understand how to engage with theologies and traditions different from my own, especially those grounded in the Christian tradition. As Unitarian Universalists, we are committed to freedom of belief and advocate for a responsible search for truth and meaning in our lives. Sometimes this lack of specificity surrounding our religious tradition will lead people to misunderstand us, thinking that Unitarian Universalists can believe anything they want. Some might even wonder how it's possible to be a religious tradition without common belief. I wanna push back against these notions Unitarian Universalism is a religious tradition with a radically different grounding than typical Catholic, Evangelical, and mainline Christianities that shape our American understandings of religion. We are not a creedal tradition. We are not a religion bound together by common faith in the traditional sense. We are a covenantal tradition we are bound together by our faith in one another and in our commitment to community. We proclaim that what is sacred can be found in relationship, 
in learning, in questioning, in seeking, and in loving each other. We are not all on the same path. We are not all looking through different windows, each refracting the light differently, but ultimately looking at that same singular source beyond. No. We are on a diverse array of paths heading towards the unknown. And yet, we together are one. As a mentor of mine, the Reverend Hope Johnson wrote, quote, we are one, a diverse group of proudly kindred spirits, here not by coincidence, but because we choose to journey together. End quote. We are a chosen community that is filled with multiplicity. As we gather here, we have chosen to seek truth through this community, through relationship with one another. We know that our beliefs and faith commitments vary. That's not just the, our tradition. That's the lifeblood of what we're doing. My faith and beliefs were formed and created through my interactions with others. Often, my interactions with others as they spoke about their beliefs. It was through these discussions that I came to understand what I believe about the world. I mean to say that these conversations helped me to uncover what's in my heart, and it is through community that I was able to live more fully into myself. I began the sermon today with a Bible reading and had one in the middle which fits quite naturally at my home congregation in Salem, Massachusetts. But many UU congregations, for many UU congregations, Bible readings are rare, even practically unheard of. We are in a tradition where, the new where someone can find meaning, hope, value, and truth in the New Testament, while another may never have read a word of it. Our historically Christian tradition can lean into that history and find community and strength from our theological ancestors. We are inheritors of an incredible tradition that we may or may not affirm theologically today. My home congregation, the First Church in Salem, is proudly in the tradition of covenantal religion. Francis Higginson, the first teacher at First Church, wrote one of the earliest Congregationalist Covenants in 1629. And we still say that original covenant today. We even have it engraved on the wall. Even if we don't affirm it theologically, it's part of our congregation's history. And yet, First Church and Unitarian Universalism were founded on ideas of covenant, relationship, and growth. Now, that's not to say that our ideas about covenant, relationship, God, and religion haven't changed. They certainly have, but we remain committed to relationship nonetheless. The seven principles are another covenant we commit to within our tradition. They are a living, breathing document which binds us on our shared journeys. In fact, the Article II Study Commission, the group, the UUA, Unitarian Universalist Association Board of Trustees, charged with reviewing the bylaws of the UUA that house the seven principles, has released their draft language to update, edit, and renew our current principles, a task we theoretically undertake every 10 years. If you want more information on this, please feel free to chat with me afterwards. But as we continue to move forward with our collective discernment, our shared journeying, I hope we can remember our commitments to multiplicity and relationship. I want to bring us back, as I close, 
to the words of the Reverend Hope Johnson. We are one, a diverse group of proudly kindred spirits. Here, not by coincidence, but because we choose to journey together. We are active and proactive. We care deeply. We live our love as best we can. We are one, working, eating, laughing, playing, singing, storytelling, sharing, and rejoicing, getting to know each other, taking risks, opening up, questioning, seeking, searching, trying to understand, struggling, making mistakes, paying attention, asking questions, listening, living our answers, learning to love our neighbors and learning to love ourselves, apologizing and forgiving with humility and being forgiven through grace, creating the beloved community together, we are one. Would you please rise in body or in spirit as we sing our closing hymn, We Would Be One, which is number 318 in your hymnals and I noticed also on the screen. Enjoy celebrating the multiplicities within our communities. Go in love as we find paths through this journey of life together. And go in peace knowing that we await to embrace you upon your return. <laughs>